they are just numbers and it doesn't make me a different human or a better human or anything. If I'm running a 324 marathon or 259, but I feel like if I know the potential is there, I wanna go after it. That's one of the biggest things in life for me is I want to make sure that I really put my heart out there and I put my mind and body out there and I really lived my potential in all ways and not have any regrets. Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspect of running, and this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. Thank you to Tracksmith for their support of For the Long Run podcast. Tracksmith is a Boston-based running apparel brand born from a desire to celebrate both the history and the evolving culture of running. Tracksmith recently released their fall collection, which was designed to celebrate the seasonal shifts as we find our rhythm this fall. I have been loving their Van Cortlandt long sleeve, which pairs well with the Alston half tights on a brisk fall day. Imagine a world where running injuries don't exist and every runner stays healthy. That's the world I want to live in, and that's exactly the world that Recover Athletics wants to make happen. Recover is the first prehab app for runners. It instantly generates custom prehab programs made up of strength, plyometric, and mobility exercises to help loosen tight muscles, get stronger, and run your best. Their team designed it with top physicians and marathoners like Met. It's guaranteed to make you a stronger and more injury-proof runner. If you want to fix your aches and pains, get stronger and set PRs, go to the App Store right now and download the Recover Athletics app today. Welcome back. I am here in Boulder, Colorado with Sarah Manderscheid. Sarah, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Of course. So what are we going to talk about today? Let's talk about Boston. Let's talk about running. (laughs) First, so who is is Sarah? Oh, uh, Sarah is a sister, a daughter, a dog mom. I have an adorable black lab, Kenzie. Uh, Sarah is an adventurer, lover of life, uh, who also runs and coaches runners. Very cool. We've shared a lot of runs here in Boulder. Yeah. Uh, How long have you been in Boulder or in the Colorado area? Yeah. So I moved to Colorado 12 years ago, moved to Denver. I moved to Boulder in 2020, right before the pandemic started, Um, shifted back to Denver for a little bit, and now I'm back in Boulder uh, to stay. So it feels really good. Very cool. And so given this is a running podcast, let's set the stage with your first run. Do you remember your first run? (laughs) Okay. So I started running later in life. I started running at 24 years old. So I don't have a lot of memories as a child running. I was really into like the creative side of life, like coloring as a child and riding my bike and playing outside. But my very first like run as a 24 year old was outside of my parents' house. And I ran from their house to Lake Michigan. I grew up in Michigan And it was this beautiful run of, you know, running through the trees and running upstairs and down staircases. And it was awesome. And it really developed or started my love for running. And why did you do it? (laughs) I started my nine to five job out of college. I was in financial services marketing for 14 years. And it was the stress of that job that led me to running and also stepping outside of my comfort zone and doing something a little bit different. So why, why running? There are plenty of things you could have picked. Yeah. CrossFit, triathlon, (laughs) not running. Right. Um, That's a really great question. I don't really remember why I bought a pair of running shoes and stepped out to like make that happen. But I did go for walks with my mom as a child. So maybe it was something with like the movement of walking that turned into running, but I'm really glad that I did it. 
And now you're a full-time running coach. I am. So yes. let's talk about like big changes. Big changes. Big changes. What inspired you to take that leap? Yeah. So like I said earlier, financial services marketing for 14 years in 2019, I just had enough of it. I just felt like there was a lot of things missing out of my life and I was feeling really stuck and unmotivated and just kind of in a sense, like flat. Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Flat, <laughs> dead to the world, flat. And I ended up quitting my job on the fly right after a team meeting on a Monday morning. <laughs> well, you weren't you weren't planning on it? I was definitely thinking about it and trying to have a strategic approach to it. And then it just happened. Like I just needed to pull the trigger and make it happen. The universe created this a beautiful door opening situation where I was able to just pull the trigger and make it happen. So I took the summer of 2019 off from anything and everything. Cause I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to go back into that world. Um, so I ended up going to a running camp in North Carolina that summer. It's the zap, um, with the zap crew. And it was one of the best weekends of my life. And I met a bunch of cool people. We went for daily runs. We had a lot of fun. And some of the run coaches there had mentioned like, oh, this could be kind of like a cool thing for you to do. Like, I think they had actually suggested that I um, start a run retreat and I had an event planning background. So I thought, cool. And then I came back to Denver and ended up working with a financial services company for another six months. I did some contract work and then the pandemic hit. And at that point I had already started my run retreat in Boulder. And I thought this is now a great time to get certified, to actually do something that I love to do. And I had you know, at that point, about 14 years experience of just pure running. So I got my certification, got my first client, and now it's where it is today. What was it like having the first person say yes? Like, I want you to coach me. It felt incredible. I remember I was sitting in the backyard of where I was living in Boulder and I was having this conversation with her and she was a beginner runner and she said yes. And I'm like, this is is the start of everything that I want to do. And it felt incredible. It felt incredible to help someone and for them to have the confidence to say yes in themselves and in the process. And then what? And then after my first client. Yeah. <laughs> um, it grew from there. It grew from there. Um, I actually moved back to Denver around that time and spent a lot of time just working on myself and working on who I wanted to be as a coach. And I think that that was a really great time for me to really process through all of that and began my coaching business. And it's been growing steadily since. And I have to say like, since Boston, it's kind of hit a different level, which has been fun. Very cool. So a lot of people say they've been working on themselves. <laughs> what is What did that mean for you and to you? Yeah, Um you did say no no holds barred on the questions. We did say that before this. Um, so I was, you know, I was going to therapy, seeing a therapist for um, about three years before last year. And then last year, I actually went into this intense program um, that was about five months long with people in the same sort of um, situation where maybe fear was holding them back or there were different things in their life where they weren't propelling to the next level. So I went through this program and it was one of the best things that I could have done for myself and for my clients. And it's really where now it's all about filling your cup and yeah. finding the joy in life and like not... I guess it's okay to do things that you don't necessarily like to do, but like try and focus more on the things that you do like to do and spend time with people that you love and people that lift you high and also be comfortable with the uncomfortable and just shoot your shot. And like, it's okay to fail and it's okay to fall flat on your face. I think running is like the perfect epitome of that <laughs> sandbox to play in, to yeah. experience all of that. I think that the pandemic has taught all of us a lot of things unrelated to infectious disease, <laughs> but <laughs> definitely to that too, but a lot about yeah. like priorities and what makes us happy and where we want to be and who we want to be with and who we want to be and all yeah. this kind of stuff. And I, I think it's, it's fascinating to hear a story like that. So when you say 
you were in a group with people who had fear maybe holding them back. I think I've had a lot of conversations with people who were like, inertia is the hardest thing. And yeah. just like taking the first step. Yeah. Um, I think back to like my fear of moving to Colorado. Like I wanted to move to Colorado for five years and I never thought it was possible. Yeah. I spent two months in Breckenridge and I was like already here when I decided to move. It's <laughs> like people are like, oh, was it hard? I was like, no, it wasn't hard. I was already here with like a very easy fallback. So yeah. I'm curious for you, where did that fear come in? And then how did you, how did you take that first step with the tools you learned with that resource? Yeah. Fear of failure for sure. Right. Like I am a type A perfectionist. Um, you really? know, I'm a runner. No, <laughs> Aren't we all like that? <laughs> so I want to be able to do things right and do them in a really thoughtful, well, like just a really great approach. And so there's that side of the coin, but then also for me, I discovered that there's also this fear of success and knowing that I'm worth whatever success is there for me and to not get in my own way for it and to just go for it. I was having this conversation with Gwen Jorgensen about yeah. fear of success and I think it's fascinating. Tell me more about what that means to you. Yeah. Fear of success. I think it's, um, where I know it's, yeah, we did say that we weren't going to hold anything back. <laughs> I'm starting to get For nervous. new listeners, this is not a fluffy podcast. We don't talk about <laughs> PRs and, and your best workouts. <laughs> Why not? Um, <laughs> I think that's boring. <laughs> yeah. Um, fear of success. Um, it definitely comes from a place of like self-worth and knowing now that I know that I'm definitely worth having a successful coaching career. And what does that look like? It looks like whatever I want it to look like. I want it to look like something different from every other coaching service out there, coaching business out there. I want to be different. And I also don't like to fail. So trying to toe the line and put myself out there in a way where if I fail, it's okay. And if I succeed, it's okay. And, you know, just loving myself. Isn't that what it's all about? Definitely. <laughs> um, the fear of success piece is interesting. Do you see yeah. that in running too, outside of your coaching? Yes. What is it? T yeah. Talking about that? Um, with athletes or with, with yourself? Oh, with myself. Yeah. I definitely have that happen. Like I ran a 10 K before Boston and I was running with a girl. Uh, we were about mile four. So we had a few miles left and, you know, I looked down at my watch and we were holding a good pace. I looked down at my watch and I thought I can't hold this pace. And I immediately like fell back and let her go. And this whole time we were kind of like helping each other along the way. And she turned back and she's like, no, come with me. And I'm like, no, no, I'm good. No, I wasn't good. I should have <laughs> stayed with her. If anyone um, has run a 10K, you know that, you know, miles four, five point two, whatever's left in it, um, they're really tough. And I needed someone there with me. Maybe I didn't need someone there with me, but it would have been a lot easier if I had someone there with me. Um, instead, I was running the streets of Fort Collins by myself. And um, there weren't many people around me and that made it really tough. So it's it's kind of twofold, right? Like in that situation, it would have been great to have someone there. And I think it's a really good example of how community and friends and asking for help is okay and asking for what you need. Yeah. So the reason I ask this is because I also think I am struggling with it. Yeah. Um, I ran Providence in 259 in yeah. 2019. And I like haven't felt, I, I still can't believe I did that. Mm -hmm. And this year I was probably more fit than I was then, like by a lot. And I couldn't execute anywhere close to that. Mm -hmm. And I've talked with my coach about it. And I've like, some of it is altitude and some of it is like, buying a house, being in a relationship, like stress, all, stress, training for marathon, <laughs> like all happening at the same time. Yeah. Um, but it was the same thing as like every so often I'd like look down at the watch and be like, this feels good, but I don't think I can hold that. Yeah. Um, and like, in reality, you probably can. Right, right. It's just, you're getting in your own head or I'm getting yeah. in my own head about it and just running based off of feel. Yeah. And sort of like the self-sabotage uh -huh. even that like, that goes into it. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Like 
I wonder, I wonder why we do that. Well, I think at least for me, like it happened today. So I, I did a track workout and I was running two, 200, 400 repeats and um, I was on the track and totally overdressed. It was about 30 degrees and sunny, but definitely overdressed. It's like and, 50 and, and uh, 5,000 feet lower. Yeah. And I'm basically wearing like, you know, long pants, long shirt, a long sleeve shirt, a vest, gloves. <laughs> I had too much on. And, um, you know, I was running on the track and I started a segment of 200s and I saw these girls running. There were two girls and they were coming up in lane one. So I ran in lane two and I thought, all right, we'll see how long I can, how long I can run this. Can I get through the 200 before they catch me? Not only did they catch me, but they passed me. And but I this think this is bolder. This is bolder. And I think that's maybe one of the best things that I love about Boulder is that I'm going to be running around people who are so much faster right. than me. And hopefully that propels me into a faster, stronger runner too. But there's also this notion of, I'm just an average runner here. And so that kind of sets in sometimes too, when I'm running of like, I'm just average. Well, I'm average in Boulder. <laughs> Boulder Average is great. <laughs> um, Matt Daniels joked that Boulder Average was having a shoe sponsor. Okay. <laughs> See, I would say like that having a shoe sponsor might be a bit above average. <laughs> he was like, I've run some four in the mile. Like, great. Yeah. Who cares? So yeah. has like half the town. <laughs> Everyone else. Totally. So I do not have a shoe sponsor. <laughs> putting that out there, Brooks. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, I guess I'm we know they're listening. a little below average. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, there's so much of that that I agree with. I was running like 515 pace on yeah. the track the other day and yeah. got my doors blown <laughs> off. <laughs> I was like, okay, like 515 is not slow, no. but I looked like I was walking. Right. And I mean, it was, right. it was a, pro track athlete sure. who just like blew right. my doors off. But on one hand, it's really motivating. Right. And on the other hand, it can really crush your spirit if you're having a tough day. I think it's funny. Yeah. As long as you're not having a tough day. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing a lot of runs with Boulder Underground yeah. and running with the women there who are like mostly in the OTQ range. Yeah. And my coach put in my log the other day, like run with them as much as like do these <laughs> long runs all the time. And yeah. he said that because- I always have fun with them yeah. and I always run strong. Yeah. And so they're all fitter than I am, 100% of them. Yeah. And I'm just a little tiny little bit slower than like the slower ones. <laughs> 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 and so for me, like it's perfect because I'm doing – it's. It's just enough. It's just enough, right? Yeah. Like they are so, they're such intelligent runners that like we start runs at 8.30 pace. Yeah. And work into 6.30 <laughs> pace. And and so the first time I, I ran with them, I was like, what is happening? Like you've all run 2.40 in the marathon and we're starting this long run at 8.30? Yeah. Like what's going on here? Yeah. And I ended up running off the front and I was like, I'm either going to get swallowed up or have a great run. Yeah. Um, we closed that run with the last three or four miles at like 6.30 to 6.45. And I was like, okay, I get it. This is how you get fit. Yeah. Um, but what I thought was, what I thought was so fascinating is that when you don't look at the watch and you just like let yourself be a part of the group mm -hmm. and just run, like I am running to my capabilities <laughs> and like I can't run that 7.30 pace yeah. for 12 miles while conversational at altitude. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Uh, feels really good. And I'm glad I didn't back off. Absolutely. I think it's a really strong testament to running based off of feel and having joy and fun while running. So we all just need to find our, <laughs> our own Boulder Underground. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever the running group is or whatever. Absolutely. But yeah, I, I do think that running a little bit more free without the watch is great. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it can definitely help. And I think there's a time and place when you do need the watch and you do need to have a pace and kind of know where you're at, but just having that balance between the two. So talking about the intersection between being a runner and being a coach, do you find yourself coaching yourself or do you, I know Tucker's your coach, but uh -huh. like, do you employ the same 
response to your own runs as you would if you saw an athlete doing what you're doing? Yeah, sometimes it depends. Um, <laughs> today I was definitely coaching myself um, at the end of the run and I was definitely coaching myself through like when I'm in runs, I'll definitely coach myself and put the coaching hat on. But there's a lot of times like we ran Boston, right? And I wanted to get back into training like today. Like, yeah. let's go. I felt really good after the run, after the race. And you PR'd and BQ'd. I did marginally, but I did. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Tough day. Um, but I felt really good. And as an athlete, I was definitely in the athlete mind of, okay, so now I have already signed up for another marathon, which is pretty close. So it's just a few months away and I want to get back at it. And as an athlete, I would have said, all right, I'm going to start running again, like Wednesday, Thursday of the week. So give myself two rest days and get back into it. And having a coach outside of me, right? Having my own run coach, that's helped me kind of pull the reins back a little bit. And he's like putting me on a better plan so I don't set myself up to either burn out or get injured and, you know, have the longevity of running, which is what we all want. And PRs are nice too. PRs are nice too. Yeah. And flow, finding flow. Flow is the best. Finding <laughs> the running flow at least in the last few years for me, it doesn't happen often. And when it does, it's one of the best feelings in life. One of the best. I think it was episode six of this podcast. So like 180 episodes ago, uh, I spoke with Magda Boulay, VP yeah. of Science and Innovation at Goo, and also a pretty incredible ultra runner herself. Um, she said that one of the reasons that she trains is to experience flow. And it's one of those things that, like, if you know, you know. <laughs> and yeah. if you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and you can't feel it without putting in the work. And so anytime, like, a new runner says, it doesn't feel good. It never feels good. It's like, you're not running enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Consistency. Good. <laughs> Consistency, more miles in, you know, a safe, healthy way. And you'll find your flow. Hopefully. Hopefully. And maybe you won't, but yeah. talk to me about what you would say to an athlete who says, I'm not having fun. I Ooh. think, I think that the reason I asked this is I think that a lot of people yeah. trained a lot during the pandemic and with no racing, like didn't take any time off because there was no like big event to yeah. taper and race and then recover from. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of people are dealing with that. Yeah. Um, so curious to hear your thoughts on what you would tell an athlete who's like, this isn't fun. Besides stop, stop. immediately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'd take a look at their plan and see like what they're doing and take a look at their runs and see how like the data looks, right? And like what's going on, if there's anything there. And then I'd ask them like their why, like what's your why for running? I think that's a really important piece to all of it. It is for me. It is for all of my athletes. It always goes back to the why, like why you're doing it and try and find wins throughout the week. I know that doesn't really help in the fun levels in the moment, but I'm a big believer in celebrating like the small things every week. Um, all the small things? <laughs> <laughs> all the <laughs> small things. <laughs> you don't want me singing. Um, so yeah, definitely um, taking a look to see like what motivates them, what drives them and seeing if there's a way that we can pivot into something better for them. Some people love running alone. Some people love running with other people. Time of day is a big factor. Listening to music, listening to podcasts, or if only there were a podcast aimed at exploring the why. <laughs> <laughs> um, total side note. I know I told you this when we first met, but <laughs> I listened when I was training for CIM, I would uh, run all my easy runs listening to John's podcast. So when we started running together, I'm like, it's like I'm listening to the podcast, but it's real life <laughs> in real time. Um, but just finding what brings them joy and then incorporating that into running. And then if you can't find that balance, maybe running isn't for that person. And that's okay too. That is true. So you said you've been running for 14 years. Yeah. Um, how has your why evolved over those years? Yeah. Um, you know, I definitely started running with this need to release stress. And over time, it's really transitioned into this 
love of the endorphins, the love of pushing myself and my boundaries. Like I'm a pretty okay runner and like, I want to see what I can do, you know, in the next few years specifically, because I'm kind of at my like, kind of in this really great sweet spot of running. And I have some, you know, I have a few years where I can tap into that potential and I love putting hard work into anything. So if I can put hard work into running to see what comes from that, that's really cool. And the goals, finding that flow, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think the, like, it feels good to work hard and it feels it good to put in the work and then see it unfold. And sometimes it doesn't, and usually it doesn't, but at some point it does. <laughs> At some point it does. And I've had, I've had a really great, you know, string of races recently. I've PR'd in every uh, distance, 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon in 2021. So I feel good about that. And like, that's from not just running the last year, year and a half consistently with a coach. It's like the last 14 years that I've put in and making sure that I'm staying consistent with my running and taking the easy days easy, hard days hard, running based off of feel some days, running with others, running solo, all that stuff. Yeah. I think the biggest secret to success in anything, particularly running is consistency. It's like, you don't have to be great. Yeah. You just have to be good. Yeah. It's the number one rule. When I bring athletes on, like consistency gets to be your best friend. So let's do this and let's set you up for success. Like if you can only run four days a week, all right, you're only running four days a week and we're going to figure out how to make that happen. Are you going to be running a really strong marathon on four days a week? Probably not, but like we can figure something out. So like your schedule works for you and you're set up for success and stay consistent with those runs. Thank you again to Tracksmith for their support of the podcast. I've been a fan of Tracksmith and their community first efforts ever since my early days of running in Boston. As my miles increase again ahead of some big goals this coming spring, I'm definitely doing it in comfort and style with their gear. I'm also proud to partner with Tracksmith because they're going to donate 5% of your order value to the Michael J. Fox Foundation for all orders, and you'll also get free shipping. The Michael J. Fox Foundation is dedicated to finding a cure and helping those living with Parkinson's. Both of my grandfathers have or had Parkinson's, and I'm grateful of Tracksmith's support for something so personal. Visit tracksmith.com slash for the long run to see some of my favorite pieces and all orders that start from that page will contribute towards this donation. Recover Athletics is a supporter of not only this podcast, but also my own running. It was built in Boston by two lifelong training partners who got tired of aches and pains getting in the way of their training. In 90 seconds, their app will customize a program for your body and your training. I've plugged in some of my more common aches and pains, and I got a custom-built program designed to strengthen the muscles and tendons that will help avoid these issues going forward. Your first custom prehab program is free, and they have an unlimited free trial. You can get it on the App Store right now by searching Recover Athletics or click the link in the show notes. If you like it and want to upgrade, their premium subscription costs less than one trip to a PT. Give Recover a try today. Your legs will thank you. So you talked about chasing some big goals. Yeah. Uh, what are those looking like? Oh, yeah. So I've had this idea of running a sub 90 half marathon. And I really thought after Boston, I was going to like pull the reins back on marathon training and get back into half marathon training, which is my first love. Like if I could just race half marathons, I'd be so happy, but there's so much potential left in the marathon. So stepping stones, right? 90 minutes in the half. Um, I'd love to, at some point, get up to that 85 minute mark. Coach says it's possible in the next few years if I stay consistent and put the work in. Um, you know, my marathon time hasn't really shifted a whole lot. I've only ran two. <laughs> <laughs> and Boston was really tough, which was my second one. And, and there was a lot of things happening on course that day. So, you know, I was in shape to probably run somewhere around three anywhere between 315, 318 probably that day. And I ran slower. Um, so in the next few years, I would love to creep up to that three hour mark. And if I can 
somehow crush a three sub three hour marathon. That'd be amazing. Or when I crush that sub three hour oh, there marathon, you go. Reframe it. um, it's going to be great. And you know, for the 5k, I'd love to get under 20 minutes short and sweet. Like I'm racing the colder boulder, uh, December 4th, 5th, something like that. Hoping to do it there and check that off the list. Oh, at altitude. At altitude. There you go. <laughs> Why not? Go big. Yeah, right. And then <laughs> your PR is 45 seconds faster, potentially. Yeah. What does it mean to you to get closer to three or get under 90 or get under 20? Yeah, it's knowing... Right, because they're just numbers. They are just numbers. And it doesn't make me a different human or a better human or anything. Right. If I'm running a 324 marathon or a 259, but I feel like if I know the potential is there, I want to go after it. And I think that's one of the biggest things in life for me is when this is all over, I want to make sure that I really put my heart out there and I put my mind and body out there and I really lived my potential in all ways and not have any regrets. And I think if I needed to pull back on my training or not get to those levels or at least try it and attempt it, right, um, that would be disappointing. That That doesn't feel good. No, definitely not. (laughs) So I'm going to bring back a question that I asked Gwen last week that I used to ask all the time. And I'm curious to hear your take on it. Yeah. What are you afraid of? Ooh, I'm afraid of definitely when this is all over, like not. You mean running or life? Life. (laughs) We're going deep. Life. When life is over. Six feet deep. (laughs) When we're going six feet under. Um that I didn't get to do everything that I wanted to do, or I didn't put myself out there enough. I wasn't comfortable with the uncomfortable enough. I didn't go big. I played small. So making sure like in this game of life that I continue to do that, and it could be small steps every single day um, or every single week, but just making sure that I can do that and stay with it, not only as an athlete, but as a coach, as a friend, as a sister, as you know, a community member. So you mentioned taking steps along the way. How do you make sure that you are proud of what you're doing? Mm. I feel like if it aligns with my values and who I am as a person, I get to be proud of it, right? It doesn't matter if it like, if I fall on my face or if it doesn't work out. That's just called trail running. (laughs) Or city running if you're me. (laughs) Yeah, Wash Park is dangerous. <laughs> you know, I took a nasty spill, like nasty, like four weeks before the race. And thankfully my knees were okay, but they were like severely bruised. And I'm like, city running is savage. Like, <laughs> come on. Um, so I think as long as, yeah, as long as what I'm doing every day aligns with who I am as a person and my values, my beliefs, it's good. Cool. Yeah. What's the first thing you ask an athlete who wants to be coached by you? What's your why? What's the most interesting why you've heard? (laughs) They're not very interesting. (laughs) I'm so sorry to all my athletes who are listening to this right now. Um, You know, I think they're all, they all have a story, right? Like they all tie back to something that maybe has happened in their life. So I would say... I recently brought on an athlete and she shared her why as something that is tied to her and her family. And they had a pretty tragic um, incident happen within their core family, immediate family. And her why is attached to that. And I think that's just a really beautiful why. But I haven't had any like off the wall whys or anything that's out of the ordinary, like health, you know, health is a big one. Just trying to stay healthy, PR chasing, um, Boston, you know, getting that BQ. Yeah. Do you have athletes that say, I don't know? No. No? No. 
No, really? they usually can give me something. Yeah. And it, I might be coaching them through it, right? Yeah. Like, well, let's let's take it back. Let's take it back. Let's take it back. Like figure it out, right? But that's one of the most important pieces for me as a coach to know that because when they're struggling or when they're not being consistent, that's my go-to. I pull that out and I use that reason and coach them through whatever they're going through with that why. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. If you know the motivation, mm-hmm. like if you know why someone wants to do something or like yeah. their North Star, you can help them do anything or yeah. you can help them believe anything. Yeah. Um, do you ask any like really hard questions? Um, My coach asked, do you have any demons? <laughs> <laughs> I love that he asked that. I should add that to my list. No, I, I don't. I don't think I do. Maybe my athletes would disagree, but they're all pretty like, in my mind, they seem just very like what a coach should be asking, right? Fundamental. Um, I mean, I ask like, when's their birthday? They don't have to tell me the year, but I like to celebrate their birthdays. (laughs) And I think that's fun. Like, I definitely like to have a more, I, I definitely want to be a coach and I also want to be a friend and someone that they can rely on if they need to. And I want to get to know them. So... Yeah, I think that takes time though. For sure. Yeah, over the course of the the coach athlete relationship. Yeah. Definitely. Talking about your use of social media, you are a very cheery, happy, <laughs> um, supportive person yeah. on Instagram. If you don't follow Sarah, yeah. highly recommend it. What is <laughs> your Instagram handle? <laughs> it's Sarah Runs Happy, and Sarah is spelled S A Y R A H. Runs happy. (laughs) She does. Confirmed. I've run with her. (laughs) Yeah. If anyone's seen me through the streets of Boulder, um, if I'm by myself, you might see like a hand like (laughs) fly up in the air or like some upper body dance moves. Like sometimes I definitely like zone into my music and I just have fun. I think for me, it's singing. And even though I'm not a great singer, I still love to sing. Um, and thankfully, I don't get to hear myself when my <laughs> AirPods are on. And, you know, just have a good time. Yeah, the fun aspect for you yeah. is is definitely huge. Yeah. Talk to me about how you, like, maintain that. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it ebbs and flows for sure. I mean, I would say there's definitely sometimes I show up. So I coach um, groups of athletes in person. So I'm training, I'm coaching a winter uh, training group right now with Tucker. And, um, we also coached a summer training group together. And I mean, there's definitely nights where I show up and I'm, you know, dragging a little bit. Sarah and runs neutral. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Maybe a little bit below neutral. <laughs> and, you know, I try and show up for the athletes because I know that they are also looking for that joy and that happiness and that inspiration. And also knowing that it's okay that I don't need to be like that if I'm not feeling it, because I also want to come across genuine, right? Like I want to be authentic. And if I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it. And there's been nights where I've left, you know, kind of in the same neutral kind of zone and that's okay. I think it's okay to be who you are, be who you feel, right? Um, but how I maintain the happiness, I just do things that fill my cup. And right now that's a whole lot of running. Well, not right in this moment, <coughs> Coach Tucker. Um, I am not running a whole lot right now, but when I am running, it feels really good. And, you know, surrounding myself with people who lift me high. I don't take on every athlete who reaches out to me. Like that's one of the biggest things that... I really struggled with up until recently where I decided, okay, I need to do this for myself. Like my athletes and I get to align together, right? So, and it's same, same is true for the winter training group or the friends that I keep, like the friends that I have, you know, just surrounding yourself with the people who make it fun, who make you a better person and go from there. Absolutely. Fast forward five years. What are you really proud of? Okay, so I'm going to be in my 40s. Um, Well, I guess at that point, definitely it's going to be my growth as a human, right? First and foremost. I think I have some really big plans or ideas for my coaching business. So I'd love 
and know that a lot of them will happen. And I've seen some really great growth. So I would love to continue that momentum into the next five years and build something that's just different and unique. Um, and I'd love to see that sub three hour marathon. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first time I saw that on the clock, it was, so I started that race, like not caring about the outcome. And that's what it took to get it. That's when it happens. That's when it happens. It does. I signed up for a four mile trail race in May, three days before the trail race. I ended up first female overall. And, and you I ran sub three? <laughs> it was four miles. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> so yes. I don't it know, was it amazing. A brutal trail. <laughs> In Larkspur? <laughs> no, it was great. Um, it was definitely sub three. And <laughs> um, but I went into it with the same, totally same mindset. I was like, well, I signed up for this, didn't taper, whatever. It's fine. I'm just going into it, having fun. And look what happened. I mean, I definitely had to push at the end, but it was fun. So how do you take that? And apply it to all races. Ooh, it's really tough because when you have an A race on the schedule, at least in for me as an athlete, I get really into that goal and into that outcome. And that's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> but I know going in, um, you know, for this last race that I ran, um, I really wanted to do well and I was really nervous and I put a lot of, there was a lot of energy into the outcome of this race. And what started to happen on the course was I was starting to give high fives to the kids early on in the early miles and, you know, thanking the volunteers as I was passing water tables. This and, is Boston. Yeah. Yeah. And that brought this level of fun that I needed. And so I think it's, you know, having your goal, right. And doing what you need to do to execute that goal while also doing whatever's going to be fun for you on the course. It could be, you know, maybe you don't care about your goals. So you're just going into it and you're just going to have fun and see what your body does. And maybe it's giving the kids high fives and like, chatting with the people next to you while you're running, if you can, and thanking the volunteers at the water tables and doing whatever you can do there. But that definitely added a level of fun to it. But I was also running really well at that point too. <laughs> so that probably had something to do with it. Uh, I love that and completely agree. So this past weekend was New York City Marathon. Yeah. And on the race coverage, the commentators mentioned how Molly gave a high five to, I think it was to her family at like mile 18 or 19 or 20 or something like that. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, at every, you know, every single ounce of energy is important to conserve at this level of racing and blah, blah, blah. And then the other announcer was like, Molly knows her body and Molly knows what gets her going. And yeah. so maybe for her, the moment of connection to her family or to whoever that person was, was worth the like, <laughs> kilojoules of energy that it takes to lift the arm up and give the high five. Um, yeah. But I'm thinking back to my own Boston experience. Did you high five the kids on the trampoline in Natick? No. What? <laughs> I didn't see them. There were like 10 trampolines <laughs> on runner's right uh, near the was... Dunkin' Donuts. Shout out to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> um, as you're leaving Natick Center. Wait, what mile was this? Uh, this would be before the Wellesley Scream Tunnel, so like 11. Okay, yeah. I mean, things started to go downhill around that point <laughs> well, it for me. Was uphill, but, but then downhill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, downhill in my own, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't, or at least I don't remember them, which is something that happens on course when I race. I don't necessarily remember a lot of what's going on around me. <laughs> so you blacked out. <laughs> That's Maybe <laughs> for about 16 miles. Yeah. <laughs> so I found the same thing. Um, I went into the race thinking that like I had a 257 as a guarantee. Yeah. And Peter Bromka's line of the marathon doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. Uh, is very true. Yeah. And so I readjusted to like, oh, run a 310 or something like that. Yeah. And I split a 95 first half. I was like, great. 
Like, You're good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll perfectly split this. Maybe I'll, you know, negative split it. Anyway, Marathon doesn't owe you anything, including <laughs> a, a good split. And it started getting hard, like really hard after my stomach sort of went south. This is like 15, 16. And so at this point I was like, I'm leaning in on fun. Yeah. I'm going to have as much freaking fun as I possibly can. And I thought about dropping out in Wellesley. Yeah. And I remember running into Wellesley, like right before the fire station. So this is right after the scream, Wellesley scream tunnel where yeah. I had like accelerated and like been on this like incredible high from high-fiving every single person for a quarter mile <laughs> uh, and reading all the signs because they were hilarious. And I thought about dropping out and I was yeah. like, do I want to keep, can I keep going? It was not, do I want to? It was like, can I run another 11 miles Yeah, or 15 miles at that point, 14 miles. And what I thought to myself was, you love this fucking race <laughs> so much. <laughs> and the last like 5K, last 10K is like so fun for me. I, I was like, get to, and I had so many friends like starting at mile 18. I was like, I must get to them. So yeah, get to there. And once you get there, you're home. I mean, yeah. I live on the course, so I was literally <laughs> home, but <laughs> which was challenging to run by my house when I was in like incredible pain. You're like I just want to stop. And yeah, I just want to stop. Like I have clothes in there. I could take a warm shower and right. like eat something. Um, and I just like I was like, I don't know when I'll get back here. I don't know if I'll get yeah. back here. It's been like so hard to get into <laughs> Boston. Like guys have to run two fifty two. It's like this is crazy. Yeah, and. It was just that like gratitude for being in the moment and like the fun that was about to happen. Yeah. And it just propels you. It does. It absolutely does. Like I remember the last 5K being really hard for me. <laughs> it wasn't very fun. Um, but it's also leaning into the crowds. Like the crowds were amazing. Um, the crowd support was awesome. And it all goes back to that gratitude goal, right? Like we get to run every day. And, you know, we got to run Boston, which was amazing. And like, it was my first time there. The whole weekend was amazing. It was incredible. I'm still kind of floating on cloud nine from it. And it was such a fun weekend. The race itself was really tough. Most of us had tough races and that's okay, but we found the fun where we could on the course. And I think at least with everyone that I've spoken with that ran they all have that gratitude of just being able to be there to run. It was a smaller group field size this year. And like just being able to get back to racing feels really good. Yes, absolutely. Grounded in gratitude. Yeah. Um, Brad Stolberg wrote a great book yeah. on the topic that I just ordered. I can't remember the name, but he just tweeted about it and he tweets about it often. So if you go to his Twitter, you'll see, <laughs> you'll see the name. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Um What's been funny to see the comparison of Chicago, Boston, New York is <laughs> everyone had a hard time at Chicago and Boston and like managed to have fun. Yeah. And everyone in New York ran a fantastic race and also managed to have fun. I'm like, oh my God, all these people had the, themselves a hell of a time and also PR'd. I know. I'm like, what could that have been like for us? But also very excited for them. Yeah. I had a handful of athletes racing and friends racing and it was so fun to watch and to see the progression through the marathon and the athletes staying strong. I'm like, you know, Chicago and Boston, we were pretty much dropping like flies at the halfway point. I've never seen so much carnage on, because oh I've, I've only ever started Boston in the charity waves. Oh, So like my okay. bib number was like 25,000 or higher. Yeah. And so I don't mean this in a bad way. Like there's a lot of walking that happens yeah. at the end of those marathons. Yeah. But I'd never seen this much walking <laughs> with people in the triple digits. <laughs> like bib number 300 and something yeah. and bib number 2000. Like I was 4,000 something and yeah. walked my way down Beacon Street. And I'm laughing because of how ridiculous this it sounds and how ridiculous it was. It was like, my friend Melissa and I, she's a 252 marathoner. Yeah. And we leapfrogged down Beacon Street. I would walk yeah. for a while and then she would pass me. 
And then I would run and then I would get tired <laughs> and then vice versa. And then the crowds would yell at us and, yeah. and we finished within like 10 seconds of each other. <laughs> and I just looked at her and she was like, what? <laughs> like, like bear. Right. And, and I was like, that was some <laughs> shit. <laughs> Is actually what I said. I was recording and I posted this on Instagram. <laughs> I felt so bad because she was like, like she had just finished it, like the hardest marathon she'd ever run. Anyway, uh, Melissa Cooney, that was so fun. Um, <laughs> anyways, marathons, if you haven't run one. They're fun. They're fun. You probably should. Yeah. You don't have to. <laughs> but they're fun. But they're fun. Um I think that's a good place to wrap. We'll leave people <laughs> who haven't run marathons thinking that we're absolutely nuts, which we might be. Um, Maybe a little bit. <laughs> but if people want to find you or your coaching or uh, you're running happy on Instagram, where can we find you? Yeah. On Instagram, I'm Sarah Runs Happy. My coaching um, website is elevateyourrunning.com. I also have an Instagram handle, uh, Elevate Your Running. I'm not as active on that page. So definitely follow me on my personal page and I'll see you there. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next time on For the Long Run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too. This podcast and the accompanying music has been produced by Brian Walters of Single Track Sound. For the Long Run's logo was created by Vanessa Wolf of Sterling Wolf. 